It's May 11th, and this is a special edition of the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy podcast. Today we discuss planning progress and delayed planning considerations. I'm your co-host, DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist Brian Buck. With me is DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist Josh Schaffner. This is episode 10 of 2018. Welcome back, listeners. Well, Brian, it's um, you know, kind of a, a gloomy day out there across southeast and, and uh, south central Minnesota today, so we thought we'd kind of get together and talk a little bit about planning progress and uh, some of the big questions that are on everyone's minds. Uh, you know, first, Brian, I think it's important to just take a look at, you know, kind of planning progress across kind of the, the area you cover um, across southeast and central Minnesota. Yeah, so I'd say in my, my southern area that I cover, which would be kind of Twin Cities, Rochester, Mankato, uh, Winthrop area, and a little north of there, we're probably closing in on that 50% done on corn. Um, not a lot of beans in the ground yet. There are some, uh, but there's a pretty big range too, just depending on you know what, what area you're in or uh, if you have the opportunity to get going. So I'd say on average 50%, but it could range from 20% all the way up to done. Yeah, I think range is probably kind of the term of the spring of where people are with planning progress. You know, where I cover on the, the I-90 corridor from Wisconsin border out to Albert Lee, um, it, it's a wide range. Certainly we have a pocket there. You know, that Austin, Albert Lee moving west on I-90, that, that's really struggled to get in the field. Conditions have been tough. You know, they might be as low as, you know, maybe 0 to 10% as we come east. You know, we have growers that are, you know, rain, you know, in all reality, in my district, I range from 0% planted for some growers to some growers that have wrapped up. At a macro level, we're probably, I'm going to say, 35 to 45% will cover, you know, from a macro level, but certainly uh, a ways to go. So, you know, some things to consider there. So, so Brian, um, you know, we're going to have a little bit of rapid fire here again, and um, I think I got segment one, so I'm going to toss it back to you. Yeah, so just to get started here, you know, obviously, uh, like I said, I, my group's had a little bit more opportunity to get rolling. Josh, you've actually had some tougher weather challenges. You got hit by quite a few more rain events. So uh, for the growers that haven't maybe had a chance to get started yet, uh, I think the, the biggest question we've got, especially as seed suppliers, is do we need to make maturity switches uh, yet? Yep, yeah, and still a question that's out there. And I will say, you know, we've been fortunate there is a lot of full season maturity, which, you know, in all reality, Brian, we're going to probably call it that 105 or 6 day. You know, let's just, let's just call it 105 for simple that did get in. But certainly, you know, as we look at the weather now, we're not going to get back to the field probably till, you know, let's just say May. 13th, 14th, 15th, depending on the the weather conditions, what happened here today, you know, and really when you look at that, our fullest season 105, we're probably going to have to look to at least coming down probably to that 100 to 102 range to get started there. But you know, one thing I'm looking at, Brian, here, if you look at just GDU accumulation on average, if I look at Rochester, Minnesota from April 28th on, you know, up until May 15th, we usually only accumulate about 139 GDUs from April 28th to May 15th. So that's not a big range when you do look at maturity, if you're just looking at, hey, you know, it feels like it's forever ago that, you know, that corn's poking on the ground, but really how far behind am I? You know, and really that's not a big number, but again, you get up there to May 22nd, we get to 213, you know, May 15th, you get to 225, 230, that's that range that we're really going to have to watch. So certainly, you know, maybe coming down to that 100, 101 is going to be um, something that we need to do for some growers on the full season, and then probably, you know, maybe put 56% of our acres in that maturity, you know, maybe another 30% down there in that 97, 98 day, and we'll see how it shakes out. But those are some things you're going to consider. Um, certainly have to make some changes, but um, not as dramatic, you know, certainly don't need to be down to, to 95 or 91 day or anything like that at this stage of the game. Yeah. And, you know, for my growers, like I said, we've had a good start and I got most of the late day corn in just like a lot of yours. Uh, if you've had that opportunity, you're in a great spot because you mm-hmm. probably still have your 100 ones, 100 day to go. So uh, everything looks good there, but I think the key there is uh, you still want to hold as much maturity as possible just to capture yield. Yeah, the yield is there, and uh, you know, usually that yield in our data, Brian, will offset maybe a point of moisture that you might have to look at in the fall. So, uh, so Brian, obviously delayed planning, other challenges, you know, that come right along with this. Um, you know, it's been a challenge, nobody's fault, but when when we get delayed planning, you know, getting nitrogen down ahead of the planter is a challenge. You know, some growers, hey, I got ground ready to go. I'm waiting on my anhydrous, my urea, my 28, whatever your source is. You know, we have growers that have corn planted without their nitrogen down. Brian, what are our options uh, for growers that are in that situation? Yeah, and I think the way the spring played out, you know, if, if you did that, that you probably made the right call. You know, you start looking at mm-hmm. the forecast. It was a good thing you planted. Um, so, you know, obviously, like you said, what do we do now? So there's there's a couple different angles to look at this. A lot of times if you're dry spreading, uh, you might have had a urea, potash, DAP, or MAP with a AMS mix planned. Um, so the big thing is just to get it out there and get it applied. So if you're going to go out and apply your urea AMS blend, 
Um, if you're, it's going to be surface applied, not incorporated. So uh, one thing you do need to keep in mind is if that urea is going out, unless you're guessing a rain the next day, you should have a urease inhibitor with it just to prevent volatilization. You don't know how long it's going to sit there. Um, you know, an interesting question I got yesterday is, you know, what about DAF? What about potash? Do we keep that in the mix? So nitrogen and ammonium sulfate, um, or, you know, the sulfate portion in ammonium sulfate, they're both very mobile in the soil where uh, FOSS is going to be your least mobile and then potash is not a lot better than the FOSS, but a little bit. So the question is, should you keep those on? You know, it's tough because if you had them planned to go on, the acres probably need the overall P and K application to begin with. Um, if your levels are really high, are you going to get a big response from putting the DAP out? Maybe not, but um, at the same time, you did you did have a plan to put it out. So you're either going to have to do it now or come back and do it in the fall. You're not going to probably be able to cut that application out uh, by any means. So in general, my recommendation, we probably just keep it out there unless there's a reason not to. If you have super high fertility levels, maybe you hadn't prepaid it. But if you have prepaid it, you know there might be an expectation for storage costs and some other things too. So uh, in general, I'd say get the spread out. Make sure you keep your sulfur out there with the ammonium sulfate and protect that nitrogen from volatilization if we're laying it on top. Yep. So dry is an option, Brian, and, and certainly some growers may say, okay, I missed that dry application. Maybe we're going to switch to liquid and maybe you know, kind of utilize that as a carrier and, and try to you know, get a couple things done as a one pass too. And certainly, you know, what's your take on, well, I had urea, maybe the pricing that big of a difference. Maybe we switch to liquid, um, get some herbicide down with it and take that approach as well. Yeah. I, you know, that's a, it's a common practice. You know, a lot of times you'll see 10 gallons go out with a, as a mm -hmm. carrier for your burn down herbicide. Um, I have seen quite a bit more go out as a burn down carrier for that herbicide. So, uh, it, it's a great option you have. I, I would still like to make sure you have sulfur in your program because I think that's something that can get cut out when that program happens. So, uh, ammonium thiosulfate, you can still use to mix with quite a few different things or uh, a later side dress, you can get it out. So, yep. um, great <clears throat> option to have also for bird down. Yeah. Yeah. So some great options there and, uh, um, some really good things to consider there, Brian. So next question, Josh, uh, Something that has been coming up, um, and we saw it, the University of Minnesota has traps out for black cutworm moss, mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like traps have been pretty high. Yeah, activity's been, you know, maybe a little higher than average and something that we're going to want to be thinking about. Um, it's not something we need to worry about today, Brian. You know, we're having flights, and certainly they're going to be laying eggs uh, in fields, and it's the larvae we're going to be concerned about. Uh, so with these flights taking place here, uh, the um, kind of late April, early May, you know, it's going to take 312 you know, degree days, same as corn, base uh, uh, temperature 50 for them to hatch and be at a uh, that fourth instar, which is their feeding stage or their cutting stage, we call it. So if we kind of do the math on that, we're going to have some risk here right at the end of May, you know, maybe May 28th through the first few days of June that we're going to want to keep an eye on. And certainly, Brian, you know, the temperature at that time, you know, it could be a narrow window that we have cutting taking place. You know, if we have a average temperature of 60 degrees, yeah, it can take, they can feed for up to 30 plus days. If it's an average of 75 degrees, it can maybe be as little as 12 days. So we're going to do some scouting there uh, late May, early June, just something to put on the radar. Nothing to alarm, uh, but certainly, you know, the later planted corn, you know, they can be, they can cut more corn and smaller than big corn. So something we're going to want to keep an eye on um, at the end of the month and early June. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll keep you up to date on um, other podcast shows and social media, um, but something we want to put on the radar. Uh, Brian, you and I were out a little bit too uh, this week looking at some alfalfa, um, alfalfa assessments, um, kind of a wide range. I, I'd certainly, I would say it's not a, a perfect overwinter, but what are your observations? Yeah, so uh, I kind of have a wide range in geography I, I cover, so I get quite a ways north and then also down here in southern Minnesota. So in general, what I looked at in southern Minnesota, I liked the way it looked. There, there was some fields uh, that maybe were shaved really low last fall and didn't hold mm -hmm. snow. Um, that have some issues or some later stands, which I think we run into that almost every year. There's going to be some stands that really struggled. But with the cold temps we had, we did have enough snow in January, I'd say, in southern Minnesota for the most part to make the stands look really good. Um, for example, I, I dug up four square feet outside of town. Um, we had 26 out of the 27 plants made it through winter. Up north where we didn't hold snow in that Alexandria area, so, you know, Sauk Center, Osakis, up there we were digging some plants. Um, we had less than half, only 13 out of 29 made it through uh, the winter. And I'd say four of the 13 that were green were going to die within a week. So um, depending on where you're at, big difference. But up north, I'd say get out and scout if you haven't looked at your alfalfa yet. Yeah, and, and for me, it's a wide range. Um, 
the older stands, you know, struggled more than others. Ones that have had a lot of traffic history, um, those are the ones we're seeing the most trouble with. And certainly um, some of the same you're seeing, but just not as severe as what you saw a little further north. Uh, Brian, always important to know where to find the show. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at FarmerBuck1. And I am at Josh Schaffner. You can also follow us on Periscope. Uh, we do do the broadcast live. And uh, following that on our Twitter accounts is a great way to see uh, the replay as well. Otherwise, you can go to podcast.pioneer.com and listen to them on there or subscribe via iTunes. Uh, YouTube.com. Uh, we actually do put the, the live video up there now. Uh, the first one was last week. So you can find us on YouTube.com, uh, keyword Schaffner, Buck, or Pioneer. Uh, that's a wrap for episode 10 of 2018. This show is recorded in Goodhue, Minnesota. It is produced by Josh Schaffner and Brian Buck. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in next time. 